All right, well, why don't we get underway? We'll let folks join us um, as they're able to get in. At least we'll get, get started on time. I um, want to thank everyone for joining us today. I'm Tara Sferuzzi. I'm the CEO of Strider. We've got Natasha Springers Levine with us today as well. Um, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Strider. Uh, a couple housekeeping notes as we go through. Um, make sure your mute mics are muted. If you have any questions, there is a chat button in the lower right. Go ahead and ask a question. Uh, you can address it either to everybody or to myself or Natasha. As we go through the agenda, jot down any questions you've got. We'll also have a Q&A at the end. Uh, the purpose to go over today um, is uh, the first thing Sorry? Uh, we've got a series of different um, topics that we're going to cover today. We're going to cover um, basically the top digital tools for the equestrian business. Strider's on a mission to connect the riders in the um, opportunities in the industry, and we know that that means that all of you need the ability to absorb new business, new revenue, new opportunities. So we're going to go through a couple different options that you've got um, that are going to simplify your life and really save you a lot of time and hopefully make you a lot of money. So that's the plan. All right, so I think everyone knows this. We're gonna cover quickly online payment tools specific to the equestrian industry. A lot of you have had some questions, especially with COVID uh, and the health issues that have been going on about how you're gonna collect payment from clients if you can't take checks or you can't see them in person. We've also had a lot of questions recently on e-signature options. How do you get those release forms before a horse show um, without having the rider mail them to you or without having the rider show up at the secretary stand to you or without having to, um, let me go ahead and do it. Um, again, if you don't have your mics muted, go ahead and mute them because we're going to get a lot of feedback as we go through this. Um, thanks. Um, we're also going to go through different ways that you can promote your activities with online entries and just using Google Analytics and Google search engine results. And Natasha is going to cover a lot on what's going on with social media right now um, and just great tips and tricks that you can use to expand your brand. And we'll also cover a lot of the email and the brand revenue and expansion on, on that. And we'll get into some Q&A. So we're going to cover the highlights of the top tools that we know about. Um, that we like and we prefer for the equestrian industry. We're not going to get into the nitty gritties um, of each one, obviously in the interest of time, but don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have questions about anything we're briefing. Um, we are going to have some additional professional development seminars that go into the specifics um, of each one of these, basically more tutorials that are geared to the equestrian industry. Okay, so first up, everyone's been asking us about how they collect payment online. Um, so you basically have a couple different options to do it in the equestrian industry. The most popular one is PayPal. So most everyone in, who's a business in the equestrian industry has some sort of PayPal account set up. Um, it's got some benefits and it's got some disadvantages. It's really good for online entries. It's really good if you need to accept payments through your website. Most developers are comfortable with PayPal. Most of them know how to put that button on your website. It's not so good for subscriptions. So if you're looking to do recurring board payments from your clients, if you've got 30 clients all trying to figure out how to send you a check, PayPal's not the best for that. Um, their subscription functionality is a paid feature. It's a little complicated to set up. It's not the best off the cuff. It's really good if you want to invoice somebody. So I'll show you in a few minutes how to do an invoice. But if you have a PayPal account, you can tell somebody they owe you money. It's a great way for them to pay you online. So if you're selling a horse to somebody in Canada and you want to get $3,000 from them and you don't want to wait on a mail check from Canada and wait for it to deposit, send them an invoice. You're going to add that 3% fee um, to the invoice. They're going to promptly pay it because they desperately want to put that deposit on the sale horse and they're looking to get into that position. Um, it's very straightforward. You can also use it easily if you have training fees that change from sort of week to week or month to month. Um, you just invoice them with PayPal. People pay online. Very straightforward. The disadvantage to PayPal is that if you're using PayPal yourself, you're going to get charged merchant fees. So you are going to get hit with that 2.9% plus 30 cents. Um, and they're going to pull it out of your revenue. So if you charge somebody 100 bucks for, say, trailering them, 
you're not going to get a hundred bucks. You're going to get, you know, $97 and 70 cents or something like that. Um, so you kind of have to work that into your math. Our recommendation is you're looking to scale your business. You're looking to reach more people. Start figuring out your workflow now that you've got a little bit of time to think about it um, and start building that 3% into your fees and start saying, okay, I need to figure out a way where I can collect more money quicker, easier, online. I know they're going to charge me 3%. How do I adjust my fee structure so that I'm not scraping each and every month for the proceeds? PayPal, standard PayPal is a free service. So that's nice. You're not paying every single month for the ability to collect payments. That's pretty easy. So, you know, generally speaking, if you want the ability to get money from riders, PayPal is really going to facilitate that. The other one that tends to be common is Stripe. So if I were to say how quickly it is to set up PayPal, you could probably get set up in PayPal and figure out invoicing about 30 minutes, um, maybe an hour. Stripe's a little bit more complicated. Stripe is great if you want to do recurring subscriptions. It's much easier than PayPal and there's no fee to it. So if you have 30 boarders all trying to pay you money each and every month, if you're doing a syndicate with a horse and you want to collect membership fees from people each and every month, if you have trusted clients out there that are comfortable giving you their charge card number and you want to bill them automatically each and every month, Stripe is fantastic for that. So if you've got clients that know that they owe you $75 or $150 and the number is going to change, you can figure out that amount, store their credit card inside your Stripe dashboard. You don't see it, but Stripe does. And then just bill them. Um, and you're just going to collect the money. Again, they're going to take your revenue, uh, cut a little bit of fees, but it's free. It's pretty straightforward. So there's some advantages there. The third one that a lot of um, you are familiar with is Strider Pay. So Strider Pay basically takes the benefits of PayPal, a little bit of the benefits of Stripes, merges them together, but gets away from that processing fee. So let's go back here. Um, I'm going to show you this real quick. Strider Pay basically says you've got a rider out there and they've got an activity. Um, you want to collect money for the activity. They're going to come to Strider. They're going to pay on Strider, um, our platform out there for bookings and revenue. Um, and then our technology figures out how to get it over to your PayPal account. We automatically add the processing fees to the balance due at time of pay -in payment. So you're not charged anything. It's a very quick and easy way for you to collect the money. I mentioned a little bit about the PayPal invoices. I'm going to show you one right now so you can see it. Let's get over here. So basically, when you go into PayPal, it says create an invoice. You can create whatever templates you want to create. You can put your branding on it. You can say how often you want to send out the invoice. You can say the date. You can say when it's due. You can schedule reminders. You can say whatever the type is. You send it out by email, and you also can CC people as you need to. Very straightforward. If you're just selecting a sale horse deposit, like I put in a, a notional one here, um, we suggest that you add the non-refundable admin processing fee to, to cover that 3%. The reason we say non-refundable is that most recently with COVID, the major charge card processors are not giving any of your fees back. So if you process $1,000 and you're paying $30 in fees, when you refund that customer, you're not getting those $30 back. Um, PayPal, Stripe, MasterCard, Visa, they're all keeping it. And that's because they lost so much revenue when they had to issue refunds uh, after the quarantine. So consider that in your business practice moving forward that you want to make sure if you're refunding something and there's a credit card fee on it, that you're not out of pocket on that credit card fee. Make sure it's as clear as possible to everybody that you don't hold those funds. They already went to MasterCard and Visa. You can't refund them. So it's an administrative fee, it's a convenience fee, it's a processing fee, whatever you want to call it. The other thing that PayPal does, which is fantastic, is auto sweep. So if you have PayPal and you haven't set this up, please, this weekend, call PayPal and set it up. What it does is it makes your life incredibly simple. 
you're collecting money with PayPal, it's getting dumped into your PayPal account. Auto sweep means that PayPal moves it right into your business checking account. You don't have to do anything. So every single night, all the money that you collect in PayPal automatically goes into your bank account. It means you don't have to worry about making payroll. You don't have to worry about moving money. All the money comes in, you collect it, and it moves right over. So definitely make sure you set that up if you haven't yet. That's one of the key tools in the industry just to release the stress on moving money. Okay. Stripe, I talked a little bit about Stripe already. Great for subscriptions. So if you've got borders that you wanna charge every single month and you wanna make sure that that money is in your business account the first of the month or by the fifth of the month, set up um, with a subscription through your Stripe dashboard, you'll collect the money each and every month. Again, you're gonna have to figure out that 3% fee, but you're gonna find that a lot of your borders um, have courses that are, you know, that's, um, it's a demographic where they've got some disposable income and they may like the convenience of paying it with their charge card each and every month. So think about that as you build it in. Um, it's a great way to streamline your syndicates for your horses and collect the money all the time. They're really good with merchant support. So if you're the sort of person that gets frustrated with dealing with these guys, um, Stripe is good with the equestrian industry because they'll answer the phones and they'll give you the answers you need. Uh, the con is that most of you probably have never worked with Stripe. Most of you don't have Stripe on your uh, websites. It's not as common. Um, it's a little bit more complex, like I said, so the onboarding is a little longer. So think about that when you're moving to digital payments. If you're not gonna get the benefit of it, you don't wanna move to it if it's gonna take you longer to onboard. You wanna plan several hours to figure out Stripe, whereas it's pretty quick to do PayPal. All right, I talked a little bit about Strider Pay already. Um, the benefit of Strider Pay, you got over here, PayPal's benefit is that it's easy. Stripe really enables you to do those recurring payments, the board payments, the subscription payments. Strider Pay basically says, you don't have to worry about anything. You're hanging out, you're relaxing, all this stuff is being done for you. The, you don't have to worry about math or the fees. You get the full payment, it's free. Um, all you have to worry about is whether or not you've got it set up um, and you've got the revenue growing and it's happening each and every day. Um, the fourth one that we wanted to mention is Intuit QuickBooks. So Intuit QuickBooks isn't really a way per se to collect money. Um, but they allow a lot of invoicing. But I want you all to think about Intuit QuickBooks as a tool that as you're growing your business, if you're processing 30,000 or more dollars a year, you know, if you're at that $50,000 mark and you're managing money from a couple different locations, you need to be thinking about some sort of software that lets you organize it all. If you're organizing it on the back of the envelope, and I know some of you are, think about setting some time to just organize the financials so that as the money comes through, whether you're doing it with check, with PayPal, whatever, um, you've got it organized because it'll make it a lot easier for you to accept more money if you know where your money is and the status of that money. It's really hard to figure out who's paid you and who hasn't paid you when you've got checks over here that might have gone through the washer and dryer and you've got money over here and you're not sure if you got paid over here. It's a subscription service. It's right now it's $12.50 a month because of COVID, they're running a special. Just keep it in mind um, for the horizon. That's a good tool to just have in your toolbox as an equestrian when you're trying to grow your business and really scale it up. We talked already a little bit about Strider Pag. Um, pretty straightforward in that regard. It's a very convenient service that we offer. So if you have questions on it, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, it does require PayPal because uh, that's how we give you your money. But do give, it a, do give it a look if you haven't already um, because it will work both for the activities but also for the services payments like board. Talked about that. Okay, so you've collected all your money. You've got it either through PayPal, you've got it through Stripe, you've got it through Strider Pay, however you got it. Um, and you're holding an activity. The next thing you're gonna need to figure out is how are you going to get that rider's signature? We've had a lot of questions about this, um, especially because Yusuf came out with e-signatures and nobody knows what that means. So very quickly, there's two different layers. E-signature is anything electronic. Um, if you mark it up on your phone, if you type your name into a web form, that's an e-signature. There's certain requirements in order for that e-signature to be legally binding um, because I can type my name into any web form and it's not 
Because, I mean, what is that, right? Um, the digital signature is what some of you are familiar with if you bought a house um, or DocuSign or something a little bit more robust. That's when you get that encrypted certificate overlaid on the document. There's a little hash on it. There's a, some sort of reassurance that it wasn't somebody just kind of typing a name on a piece of paper and handing it to you at the secretary stand and saying, please, please, please take this piece of paper. It's got an audit trail. It's validated your identity somehow. Either you signed in with the username and password, you signed in with your email address, whatever it is, it figures it out. The problem with digital signatures is that they're really expensive for the equestrian organizer. In order for you to sign up with one of those services, you're looking at 40 to 200 bucks a month. So your normal horse show venue doesn't want to spend another 200 bucks a month just to get a digital signature from somebody. And we know that. So we looked at what are tools that you guys can use for e-signatures. E-signatures have three requirements. So if you want to send something to USCF and you want it to be legally compliant with them, you want your insurance company to take it, you want your lawyer to take it. You have to have a statement on your liability release that all parties agree to use electronic signature. I cannot tell you how many waivers are on Strata right now that do not have that statement. Every single one of them is, will not hold up in a court of law. So you've got to add that statement. I'll show you an example of a statement. Um, USEF has started putting it on the, all their releases. Both parties have to consent, use an electronic oh, signature, what? and they have to recognize that that is the same legally binding signature as a handwritten signature. That's going to be on the form. You need an audit trail. So you need some sort of proof that if I walk up to you and I have a piece of paper and it says, Okay, this is signed. Um, I'm Laura Graves. And then I walk away. Two years later, you've got to be able to show where that piece of paper came from and who the person was. So you're going to need some sort of an electronic trail associated with that form, either their email, they sent it through an online entry system like Strider, Event Entries, Equestrian Entries, Fox Village Dressage, whatever it is, there's got to be some sort of service that said, hey, it passed through this route. And the third thing you got to think about is using PDFs. So a lot of organizers and venues are still using Word. It's not going to work for e-signatures. It's too easily um, edited by the person signing it, and they're going to change the clauses, whether they do it intentionally or accidentally. Convert all your Word documents to PDF. Make sure it has a statement on it that says all parties agree to use electronic signatures, and they agree that it's legally binding. And then think about your audit trail. So knowing that nobody wants to spend a fortune on e-signatures, knowing that the horse industry is already struggling, um, we're going to show you a couple quick hacks for how you can get those riders when they show up at your facility without a signed entry form to quickly sign the entry form. So let's go through them. First thing is, turns out your iPhone allows you to e-sign any PDF you get. I'm not sure everybody knew that. I certainly didn't know it. So. Let's look at this real quick. Okay, so I show up at a facility, let's say I'm at Morven Park or I'm at Woodside out in California, and I'm in my truck, it's right after the COVID quarantine is lifted, and I really want to take my horse out there and do a dressage test or do a hunter jumper show. And I show up and the organizer is like, you're not getting out of your truck because you don't have a sign release on file. Well, I'm in my truck, so I don't have a printer with me, so I certainly can't print anything. And they're dealing with COVID, so they're not going to hand me a piece of paper. And they're certainly not going to hand me a pen. So now I'm there with my horse, and I don't have a sign release on fire. So this is how you're going to get around it. You're going to, the person's got to get emailed the PDF, or they're going to have it all ready because you're going to email everybody and anybody the PDF, or you're going to give them a link. Um, we suggest that if you have a facility website, do www, the name of your facility, dot com, backslash waiver. Put the PDF right there. So the minute they show up, every single facility's got the waiver in the exact same location. They can download the PDF, and here it is. So you're going to click on the PDF. And when you click on the PDF, see this up here? This is the edit button that shows up on your iPhone when you double click on it. So you're going to click on it. And then you get all these markers down here that everyone's used to, right? But what probably folks are not used to is this plus sign right down here. 
Let's see if I can show it to you. That plus sign brings up a signature feature, which means anybody on their iPhone can sign that PDF. So when you click on that signature, now I'm typing in the signature. So Robert Dover's hanging out and he's like, all right, fine, I need to sign this. You can make it prettier, but the minute somebody signs on their iPhone, the iPhone stores that signature. Um, and you can use it again and again and again at every single facility you go to. So now you've created that signature, and now this is all again on the iPhone. You put that signature right where you need it, for that, that electronic signature. You say that you're done after you place it exactly where you want it. And then there's a new message and that signed signature release is gonna go right over to whoever organizer you need to send it to. So there's never a reason for a writer to show up and not have a piece of paper and not be able to sign a PDF exactly on the spot. Um, similar functionality in the Androids. I showed the iPhone because I figured um, most of the folks on the call would be familiar with that. Um, but definitely a great tool to have in your toolbox as you have writers needing to come to you as they're working from home, and a lot of them don't have printers right now, it's an easy way for them to send you a sign release. Um, when they email it to you, there's an audit trail. They can also email it to themselves and add it to an entry. So you've got it automatically with the entry. Then it becomes a legally binding signature. Down here, you can see just barely. The agreement says that it may be electronically signed. They agree that placing it is you know, valid, enforceable, and admissible. So that's how you do it on the iPhone. Now, let's go over here. This is that same release that I did on the iPhone. And what I did was I said, well, I want to type my signature here. If I show up at a facility and I print out this document and I hand the printed document to somebody, that's not legally enforceable. So think about electronic signatures need to be electronically sent. Printed signatures are fine to be printed or electronically sent. But if you've got an electronic signature and you want to use a typed version, it's too easy for somebody to stoop that name. I could have written Kate Middleton or something on that and it would have been just the same degree of enforcement. So even though it's got that clause, there's got to be an audit trail. So make sure that you're not hand accepting electronic signatures in order for it to be enforceable. Now let's pretend I want to sign this document. Let's go to, we got war DACA over here. So now we want, we got war DACAs. We've added the clause that says we're agreeing that an electronic signature is legally and binding that USCF requires. And we're gonna say, all right, up here, again, this is on everybody's computer, I'm just gonna hit the sign button and I'm gonna create a signature. So I'm gonna click here, whatever I write using my mouse, different computers are gonna have different stuff, but basically I use this, I put it here, the next thing I know, I've got a signed document uh, in PDF that I can email to the organizer that's legally enforceable. I can also add it to my Strider entry or any other entry that I'm using for an online system. So those are quick and easy ways for the rider, either through the iPhone markup or the PDF signature, to give you an electronic signature that's legally enforceable and it's free. That doesn't necessarily mean that every single rider is going to figure it out. We're going to put a link on our website that you guys can all reference. Um, some writers are going to say, no problem, I've got this, I can handle it. And other writers are just going to have problems with it. We get it. So you're going to have to work with them a little bit. But if you know that the functionality is there, it makes it a lot easier when they show up at your facility. We've also got a functionality that we've built in based um, on recent organizers' request, which is... Um, that the rider can, or that the organizer essentially has partnered with Strider to do a release. It's loaded up exactly as their format. They go through. It has an audit series trail that's legally enforceable. They fill out all the information, they sign it, 
And then at the end, you see the physical manifestation of the signature. There's an audit trail. That will hold up in any court of law. That's exactly what they want. So um, we did that basically by putting it on the website. You can see here, Strider Pro, it's Maryland's release. You go through here, every single rider in America can go to this exact same URL and fill out this form hundreds and hundreds of times. And then it gets emailed automatically to the organizer or to the facility um, venue. And it also turns into a PDF that the rider can download and attach to their entry. So it's a pretty good utility um, that's available. So if you're interested in that, let us know. Um, we're going to be offering it on a beta trial throughout the summer, uh, free, and then it will turn into a subscription service moving forward. Um, very user friendly, very easy for folks to get hundreds and hundreds of e-signatures throughout the month. So think about that. We also had a lot of questions. Oops, sorry guys. We had a lot of questions about putting it on your own website. Most of you have WordPress. So if you have WordPress, the industry leader is something called Approve Me. Pretty straightforward to put on your website if you've got a developer that you're comfortable with. Uh, it's going to cost you for the plugin on an annual basis, and it's also going to cost you for the developer. You should budget roughly about $1,000, maybe a little less, maybe a little more to get it onto the website. After that, all your riders will be able to go and they'll be able to digitally sign the forms and then attach it to their entry um, at any time. So that's your other option that's out there for the e-signatures. If you wanted something more robust, it's not currently being required by the industry, by any of the associations or the legal requirements. Um, the e-signatures are sufficient. You don't need a digital signature per se. You do need that audit trail. Um, so make sure that your forms are consistent with the requirements for the e-signatures. And that way you won't be caught unaware You'll have that consent statement at the bottom of your form that everyone's going to use an electronic signature. You're using PDFs, not Word docs. Get rid of the Word docs. Make sure that you keep in mind what that audit trail is. So if a rider comes up to you at a horse show and hands you their form, and it's an e-signature form, you got to say, no, I need it electronically. Um, you should have uploaded it online or upload it now online. And a lot of you now have moved to that where you've got that upload feature on your website. So keep that going. All right, um, with that, we're going to move over to Natasha. I'm going to stop screen sharing. Um, she's going to talk a little bit about, after you've accepted the entry, um, a little bit about what the activity promotions are and features about increasing the visibility, getting more of those entries, getting more of that revenue through digital payments and the social media. You want to remember a couple of things when you are using Strider. So, it is always very, very important to maximize the description section of what you are hosting. Those first three lines of your description are going to show up in a Google search. Every time that you post an activity on Strider and you hit publish, you're creating a new search query on Google. So I can show you a quick example. If I search Boyd Martin at Rutledge Farm, the first thing that comes up is Strider because we've created, right, through just the way the platform works, a new search query. Um, and as you can see, this description tells exactly what's going to happen um, and hits a lot of those keywords that Google is looking for. So if you're hosting a dressage show, you're going to want to include the word dressage show. You're probably gonna also want to include something about your facility, um, the name, the location, um, you know, you can pepper in words like USDF, USEF, and FBI, that sort of thing. So again, maximizing all of the sort of ways that you can get the most out of what you're putting on the internet. Um, as you can see, you can make any selection that you want here. One more thing I wanted to show as Tara was just talking about documents. So the Strider platform enables you to add a release of your PDF. Um, and Tara also mentioned the new electronic feature that we have, which is really exciting. Um, another thing to note here in this section where you can upload, again, more pieces of your personal marketing materials, because that's what, that's what they are, right? 
Um, the photo that you use, the title of it, will also show up in a Google search. So you will want to use, you know, your facility's title or dressage. Mm -hmm. so again, just keep plugging in points um, so that Google can pick you up, that sort of thing. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you our custom announcement form. So let's say that you're hosting something that you don't see on our drop down menu, um, or you have a class that you want to add to a dressage show, a jumper show, whatever. Um, we encourage you to use the custom announcement form. So this enables you to title these selections however you would like to. Um, and again, same thing with the announcement. I'm going to want to maximize my points. Um, and, and get the word out as quickly, as expeditiously as possible. Um, so, and then I will use Strider Pay for this example. So the funds will be routed to me immediately as people sign up to ride an audit, which is pretty convenient. Um, so once it's published, you'll see something that looks like this, right? This is just our standard announcement form. This is for an upcoming show at the lovely Beverly Equestrian, you can see that they picked a great photo, right? Because this is very visually appealing. It gives you an idea of what to expect at their event, right? It sort of describes the event. Um, and then they have a really, really clear outline of what's happening. Her release form is right here for riders to click and download, e-signature, and then re-upload um, along with their registration. So the thing here that's sort of key and that'll move us into talking about social media and how to spread the word, how to get the word out um, is, oh no, here we go, <laughs> um, is this link. So every activity that is posted to the Strider platform has its own link. That's what you want to maximize, right? Because you want entries for your horse show, you want entries for your clinic. So you want to make sure that you're driving people to that link. So we use things like Facebook, Instagram, um, and of course, email marketing. So I wanted to talk a little bit about creating a Facebook post about business pages versus personal pages. Um, I know that there are sometimes questions about what is appropriate to post on a business page versus a personal page and that sort of thing. So we can cover that. And if anyone has any questions, we'll circle back to it at the end. Um, so you'll see I pasted the link in here and this lovely preview photo came up. If you use a good photo that is above 300 kilobytes, it will show up as a preview. Now, sometimes Facebook will say fetching preview and you'll see nothing. Try to just delete the link and paste it again because chances are it'll come up. Um, another great trick is that, you know, that link was sort of ugly and clunky looking. If I now type a post, that link is going to stay regardless of what I put in the post, which is pretty ideal, right? Because now I can, I can sort of shape the post however I want to. Um, another important thing to do is use the tagging feature on Facebook. So you'll see I just tagged Beverly Equestrian, right? And obviously this is just an example. So I'm using the Strider business page to, to show how the functionality works. You always wanna use the ampersand to try to call to attention that you were trying to tag something. Um, and if you see the blue highlighted text, like you'll see Beverly Equestrian there, that indicates that they have been tagged. So once you hit post, you're going to, send them a notification that you're talking about them, right? And so that's exactly what anyone who sponsors your horse shows or clinics, that's what they're looking for. They want to know that you're talking about them. If you just mention them without that ampersand and without that blue highlighted text, they're never going to know unless they stalk you. <laughs> um, and we don't really encourage stalking. So you wanna make sure that their page and their administrators of their page are notified that you're talking about them, right? Because that's what a sponsor looks at when they determine the value of partnering with your business. They wanna know how much traffic you're sending to their business and, and how much you're making people aware of their business. Um, 
So that's just a bit on tagging. And if you have any show sponsors, you know, you can say prizes sponsored by Buckeye Equestrian or, or whoever. Um, so you'll see this little notification down here, post scheduling and additional options available in publishing tools. That's something that we'll circle back to in a few minutes. Um, once you have published a post, you will want to share it, right? So one thing to do is just share something to your page. If you have 15,000 followers, that's wonderful. If you don't have 15,000 followers, then what you'll want to do is share that post. So you can share things from your business page or from your personal page. If you are your own business owner, that's a fantastic thing to do. So you can say, hey guys, I organized this horse show, please come to it. Um, or here's the announcement, entries are now open. Um, another great way to get the word out, especially if you don't have 15,000 followers, is to post in groups. Um, and Tara and I will send out a list to all of you of our 50 favorite equestrian Facebook groups. Um, these are a really, really great way to just spread the word quickly and easily about what you're doing without doing all that much legwork, right? Because you can just either copy and paste your link or whatever you want to say directly into the group, or you can hit share on a post and you can share directly to a group and just type in the group so we can say, you know, USCA area one. Um, and you can type something extra or this will have the extra text that, you know, we, we typed in yesterday. Um, another great way to spread the word about upcoming events is to create Facebook events. So I think there are a couple of important things to note here. Um, you can really maximize what you have going on. So you can bring in the other tools that you're using like digital payments, um, digital registrations, what have you into your Facebook event, or you can kind of confuse people. <laughs> so you want to think of the Facebook event as a way to continue to drive people to your activity page, um, to the page on your website that has more information about what you want them to know about anything like that. Um, you basically just go through, you set a date, um, the cool thing about events, especially if you tag your sponsors and your partners, is that they can add them to their pages. So you want, you really want to harness that sort of organic cross promotion. And that's the reason that tagging is so beneficial, because if they get the notification that they're involved with something, chances are they're going to share it as well. So that's reaching even more riders and even more potential customers. Um, this is the scheduling feature. So you can find this in the more section of your page manager on Facebook. Um, there's a publishing tools tab. And so what you do is just create your post and it looks pretty similar to the standard post creation, right? So you drag and drop your photos, add your link, however you want to do it. You can schedule these in advance, which is really fantastic if you know that you have a hectic week coming up at a horse show and you don't have time to, you know, talk about thanking your team at home or things that are coming up in a month, right? You can schedule those posts in advance um, when you have time so that you don't have to scramble to do it while you're doing a thousand other things. Um, so that's sort of the skinny on, on Facebook. And I think another great tool that a lot of equestrian businesses are embracing and a lot of equestrians are embracing more and more is Instagram. Um, so Instagram, as you probably know, is a little bit more mobile friendly than desktop friendly. So it's actually sort of challenging to show you guys uh, the best practices for Instagram through this webinar, but we have a little bit of a helpful how-to video um, that I can bring up. So basically Instagram is fantastic for keeping people aware of your business. Um, it's great for behind the scenes stuff. Hey, this is what's going on. Here's a beautiful picture of my horse today. Uh, we have so much fun going cross country schooling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, tagging is a little bit simpler on Instagram. All you have to do is make sure that you have the person's username 
um, correct, and then just do the ampersand sign and Instagram handles the rest. Facebook can sometimes be a little tricky. You have to make sure that you have the correct page tagged um, when that blue text is highlighted. So again, while Instagram is great for sort of brand building and business awareness, it's not that fantastic for driving people to something specific, right? I mean, we've all gotten stuck in the sort of Instagram doldrums where you're scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, and it's kind of easier to just stay scrolling. But if you really have something special coming up, some sort of big masterclass that you've organized or a big horse show that's your series finale, um, you can drive people to that registration page or to whatever you'd like to have them do by adding a link to your bio because links will not show up in Instagram comments. Okay, they will, they, the text will be there, but it's plain text. People can't click through it. So it just kind of looks chunky, right? Because it's usually those long URLs um, that you don't really have control over. So I made a quick video just to demonstrate how to add a link to your bio. Um, and I used just this event. Um, and I, I went through the whole process, copy and pasting on my phone, just to show you guys the, the best overview of, of this good practice. So you'll see I copy and paste. I go to Instagram. And then there's an edit button so that I can edit my profile, right? And any time that you edit your profile, it really takes 30 seconds. I timed it out. Um, it's not something that's challenging. It's not something that will take a lot of time and it's really, really something to get comfortable with. It's very simple to do. So again, you just delete what's there, paste your new URL, and then hit save and you're ready to go. So you saw that URL change there and then we can just click it and open it up, right? So then riders are seeing your stuff within their scrolling time. Um, so again, Instagram is kind of manual, as I discussed, it's, it's a little bit more, you have to be on your phone doing it. Um, you have to sort of realize the, the shortcomings of it and the advantages, but we have some cool tips to help you guys schedule things in advance. Um, one of them is Hootsuite which is an Instagram scheduler. You can actually add any of your social media platforms. Um, their free version allows you to add two social media accounts. So you can add your Facebook and your Instagram, or you could add your Pinterest and your Instagram, whatever platforms that you use or Twitter, um, whatever platforms that you use to get the word out to people, you can add them to Hootsuite and schedule your posts in advance. If you're not comfortable with the Facebook, um, publishing tools. So this is Hootsuite and you'll see it sort of shows up in a calendar view, which is really handy if you think in a calendar form. Um, and you'll see that we have some posts scheduled for Friday and Saturday. So there's a little sneak peek for everybody of what's to come. Um, this is an awesome tool. We use it. I, we fully rely on it. Um, you can create posts very easily. And again, you just type in what you want to type, drag and drop your stuff. You can add locations, which are a great tool to use. So if your farm is located in Ocala, Florida, and you're trying to get the word out to people in Ocala, tag the location as Ocala. And you may want to do something like you rotate that with your own farm's location on Instagram. Um, and that will pull more people in and get you better visibility over time. Um, so again, this is a scheduling tool that we absolutely love here at Strider. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, there are a couple of other schedulers. Buffer is one of them. Loomly is another. Um, I have to say that Hootsuite is the one that I'm personally most comfortable with and their free version has fantastic functionality. Um, so in terms of scheduling, there's another great way to sort of get the word out and reach more people and that is email marketing, right? So this is a platform called MailChimp 
And it is basically, it's pretty similar to constant contact or um, eye contact or any of those. So it allows you to import email lists and then email those lists. Um, and a couple of things that are really important to remember about your email lists are that they are very, very simple to grow. So if you are hosting a lot of equestrian events, right? People who come to your horse show, they've told you already that they want to hear from you again, that they want to come to your next horse show, that they want to come to your next clinic. So when you see that person walk in, you know, collect their rider number or whatever, they've already committed to being there. You have carte blanche to email that person because they've already consented, right? Especially if you have and unsubscribe in your email, which everybody should have. Um, another thing to remember with your email marketing is that this will automatically BCC everybody, right? So that you're not seeing emails to 150 people and you're not sharing everyone's personal email information. Um, so this will just send an email as your business and or whatever name you decide to input um, and it will allow you to track your opens track your clicks and see how many people are engaging with what you have to say um, email marketing is far and away the quickest way to get the word out um, to people who are already engaged with your business so when we see an activity posted to Strider, we can see how many page views that activity has. Um, activities with good page views are usually 100 plus, right? And those are the activities that are going to have higher registration rates, they're going to have more riders attending, um, and they're going to be more talked about. So when you email out your link to people, those page views go way up. When you share your link in a Facebook group, those page views go way up. The, the best way to sort of get people engaged is by being really, really direct in the actions that you want them to take, right? Come join our horse show. Come ride in this great masterclass clinic. Um, so Natasha's covered um, the bulk of the email benefits. Uh, one of the things she really talked about was that organic cross promotion with social media. Social media is a fantastic way to expand your circle. So if you don't have any clients currently, if you need more clients from a wider area, if you need to stop hitting the same people you've always hit, that's where you're going to broaden out. You're going to start hitting geographies and people that you've never even known existed when you branch out on social media and when you start sharing to the groups and you we start seeing that the hits to your activity pages get wider and wider and wider and that you start getting registrations from a larger circle of users on the platform. Um, it definitely, definitely works. Where email comes in is you've already gotten their interest. They've already, they've either opted in for your newsletter or they've come to an activity already at your facility. It is a tangible, personal way to re-engage those people and say, hey, I've got another activity. You already liked the first activity because you came to it. I want to grow my revenue. I want to grow my entries. I'm going to let you know about the next activity. They really want to hear from you. Uh, I can't state that enough. Natasha's already beat the drum on it. But it's one of the easiest ways for you to showcase the sponsors and the partners. So if you're a top rider looking to get more sponsors, they want to know what you're going to do for them. And if you say, oh, I send out an email every month or I send out an email every quarter that showcases my partners, then they know that the size of your email list matters. So don't take those emails lightly. If someone gives you their email address and they come to your horse show, they come to your clinic, make sure you start curating that list and start keeping that list. The reason we love digital entries and digital um, releases is because everything comes to you electronically. You don't have to hand type in anything. So when that rider automatically adds their release to their entry, when they give you when they give you their email address in their entry, it allows you just to quickly, boom, I'm going to auto-populate my mail list, and that's where it goes. Um, the other thing about email is that if you post something on social media, it's a pretty short duration. Facebook either shows it or they don't show it to your followers. Um, same thing with group. If you're not actively following that group at that particular time, eventually it's going to kind of go down a little bit. Whereas email, we keep seeing the opens. 10 hours to 16 hours. So you've got a little bit more longevity with an already captive audience. So think about all that. 
The programs, some of you were asking about the programs. Natasha talked a bit about MailChimp. Um, we see basically it's, it's binary. Either folks use their personal email or they use one of the commercial emails. There are some commercial add-ons to the personal emails. If you're getting over 50 emails, you want to think about switching over to those commercial ones. And I know nobody wants to hear that, but you're spending a lot of time drafting those emails. You're spending a lot of time copying and pasting email addresses into the emails, breaking a big list into smaller lists so that you can send it out in Hotmail or Yahoo or Gmail. Um, you're trying to grow your business. You're trying to reach more people. The way to do that sustainably to direct, pull in more registrations and pull in more revenue is you need tools that can carry you along that journey and scale up as you scale more contacts. And so that's stuff like the MailChimp and the Constant Contact. Uh, we like MailChimp because it's very cost effective. If you're under 500, it's like $9 a month. Um, it lets you do the scheduling, which is also really nice. Um, it's a great feature. Um, the other thing that lets you do scheduling that we didn't totally mention is if you have working students. So don't hesitate to think about the fact that you've got staff, you've got people who work with you. If you've got working students or you've got people on, in your barn under the age of, I don't know, 26, they're still figuring out their career path. They're still concerned about their resume and their professional development. So you don't have to do each and every one of these things yourself. Consider outsourcing some of it to somebody and say, this is the message I wanna get out on social media. Um, can you help me schedule the posts? Or if I schedule the posts and tell you when they're posting, can you share them to the groups for me um, on behalf of the business? If I sign up for the free version of MailChimp and I need somebody to hit send at 7 a.m. because that's the right time to send an email to a professional um, audience that is busy during the day and not going to open up an email from a horse farm at 3 a.m. Um, or 3 p.m., um, can you hit send on that? Because I don't want to pay for the paid version. So consider those resources as you're scaling things up because you're going to get more entries. You're going to get more payment, which means you're going to get more contacts and you want to keep them engaged so they keep coming back. Um, so think about what sort of workflows you need to have to do that. The other thing I want to make sure that everybody knows um, is what you do with those emails. Uh, most people don't think about this, but when you get an email address, um, there's something called the CAN Spam Act. The individual, the rider, opted in to get emails, usually from your facility. So when they enter an activity on Strider, they opt in to get emails from your facility because you have to email them ride times, right? It's pretty straightforward. Um, they didn't opt in to getting emails from Billy Bob down the street who operates the truck repair center. They didn't opt in to get emails from the saddle fitter you're really hoping are gonna get you, you know, raise up their sponsorship of your facility. So once you get that email list, you can't give it away. You can't sell it. Those riders opted into one thing. And if you start giving that email list away, um, you're essentially in violation of the Can Spam Act. You're having unsolicited marketing emails go out to individuals that didn't opt into it. And so if you hit the wrong person at the wrong time, it gets really expensive. It's $40,000 an email if the FBI decides to come after your Department of Justice. So just be a little sensitive to that. Um, I know it's the horse industry. I know everyone kind of plays loose and goose with different things. But as your email list starts getting larger and larger, protect it. Make sure you don't give it away um, and it winds up in the hands of a business that passes it to another business who sells it to another business. So it can only be used for the purpose collective. Just have to make sure everyone knows that. Your best practices. Um, Natasha touched on this. Make it easy on the router every time you write those emails. Think Amazon one click. So if you say click here to enter my activity, put that starter URL right on that click. Make it easy for them. Um, think about when you're going to get that delivery. So you know your riders best, you know your clients best. Um, are they working at two o'clock in the afternoon? Or are they reading emails at two o'clock in the afternoon? If they're working, they're probably not going to read an email. Um, maybe at 6 p.m., 7 p.m., maybe at 6 a.m. Um, as you're scaling up that list, automate that opt-in, opt-out. No one wants to email you personally and say, I want to be off your list. That means you've already gotten into the negativity. You want to keep them positive. So if they don't want it, no problem. They just click, they opt-out. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. And I've already mentioned the, the showcase your, your email list. So that's the 
tight, tight, uh, tightest we can get those the stuff. Um, I know there's a list of questions that came in, and, and certainly use the chat function to ask some other questions. Um, we're happy to answer anything about some of the items we've raised. Uh, Natasha, do you want to start on a couple of the questions that we have? Yep. Yep. So I think that you covered a vast majority of. Well, actually. Let's maybe reiterate this one. I think it's a good one that came in. Um, is a digital copy of a release form or one that's signed online as much protection from liability as a paper copy? Excellent question. Okay. So digital um, is being used interchangeably throughout the industry with electronic. Your electronic um, signature is as good as a paper copy if you've done the audit trail and if you have that statement that all parties opt in to use electronic signatures and what the implications of using electronic signatures are. So if you look at the bottom of the USEF release, they have a statement now um, that they added a few months ago when COVID start, first started getting crazy that basically said both parties can um, consent to using electronic signatures and they understand the implications. If that's not on your release, it's not as good as a paper one to put it on your release. Awesome. Um, so the next question is, what are the best social media platforms for marketing your business and how do you use them differently? So for example, Facebook versus Instagram versus Twitter. Um, so I think I can speak to that a bit. Um, I will say Facebook is going to get you the most direct click throughs. Instagram, as I mentioned before, is going to help create that community and that brand awareness. Um, Twitter, I think, again, is good for click throughs. I personally, I cannot speak much to Twitter. Um, and I think the equestrian industry does not quite have Twitter in its grasp. Um, so I think focusing on Facebook and Instagram is great. Uh, if that is what you can handle, right? You have to figure out what you have time for in a day. Um, I think another key thing that I probably didn't mention in my spiel um, is that you have to be cognizant of how much you are asking people to do. If every single day you post a link that you need them to click, they're probably not going to stay that committed to liking your posts and engaging with your posts, right? They want to see videos. They want to see um, a shot of your horse warming up. They want to see something that's just fun and easy to digest every once in a while. Um, if you ask too much from them, if you say, hey, click here for my sponsors this, hey, click here to do this, I, I think it gets a little bit overwhelming as people are scrolling through, um, especially in today's day and age where social media can be a little overwhelming. <laughs> oh, I saw some questions. Um, so how do I bring emails from Strider to my MailChimp email list? That's a super question. Um, Tara, would you like to speak to that or would you like me to cover it? Sure. So um, right now, what we are recommending, um, there is a, another software service called Zapier. And so Zapier bridges all those connections between MailChimp and any email you get. So let's pretend you're getting it through Gmail. So you're an organizer um, and you get your email notifications um, that come to your Gmail account. Um, you somehow have to take the email that's inside that Gmail and pass it over to MailChimp. It's called an email parser, um, and we'll send out the link to it um, in the resource guide. But basically, Zapier, free service, um, reads inside your email, and you've told Zapier, I need the first name, the last name of the writer, and I need their email address. And then once you get those three things, I want you to send it over to MailChimp and populate this newsletter, this, this list, and these people are automatically opted in. And so Zapier checks the emails and says, does it meet the criteria? Does it meet the criteria? Yep, it came from Strata, it met the criteria. Okay, pulling out the information, sending it over to MailChimp. Um, so we can help you with that uh, if you have questions about how to do it. But yes, there is an automated way to do it and not have to manually import your long reports each and every activity. So great question. Which is also, I'm not sure if that was covered at all, but every time that you get an email through Strider, every time you get a registration, you do have all of that information in your long report, which is a CSV file, which is exactly what MailChimp or Constant Contact is looking for. So they want you to re-upload. Um, basically, you just add it to your desktop and add it to MailChimp after that. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. So if you didn't want to do what that complicated way of automation, um, as Natasha just pointed out, you're literally just going to download that file and upload it into MailChimp and boom, it's all right there. So that's the quick and easy version. Oh, there was a follow up question. Can I get emails off of previous events that you've hosted on Strider? Yes, you can. Um, you can look through your organizer's corner um, and there will be a past events tab. So you can actually select the year. So in the one that I happen to be looking at right now, I have things going back to 2016. Um, so I can click through all of those and access the registrations from the past. Um, oh, and then here's another question. Um, how do you add additional dressage tests? For example, the pre-St. George, Inter 1 and 2, and Grand Prix to the list of tests for a schooling show. You email Strider and say it's not currently in the list of the schooling shows and we can have them added to the back end. <laughs> and I'm assuming you don't want to use the custom form, you want to use the template form and that's how you would do it. If there's, if there's a dressage test that's not at one of those features, just send us an email. We'll get it added for you. Um, if you do want to use the custom form, because I do see that follow-up question here, um, the custom announcement form is in your organizer's corner. There's a tab that says post your activity um, and it's right under, oh, sorry. So the tab that says post your activity is right above the post custom activity uh, option. So that's where you would see the custom announcement form. Is there a way to share a draft with my co-organizer before we publish to Strider? Um, best, go ahead. Oh, the best thing to do is just share your login details with them. So save the draft um, and you can save it as a template if you're hosting a number of events that are the same. Um, save the draft and just have them log into your account. We had a question from, I'm a show photographer. Would it be a violation of the SPAM Act if the show secretary provided me an email list of riders to let them know I'm photographing the show or after the show to let them know that I have photos of their ride? Um, no, because they probably opted in to get correspondence from the show secretary when they signed up for the show. They're expecting to get correspondence from the show secretary. And they're normally expecting to get correspondence about various partners that are offering services with the show. So that's, I would put that in the reasonable scope. That's not unreasonable. If you took that email list and continued to privately email the list of riders who entered that horse show for the next three years, yes. Because they never opted into personally getting emails from you. Um, a limited scope engagement that's associated with an activity that they opted into, perfectly reasonable. You're not going to get any objections on that. But again, if you email them, do your best to have that opt out um, in the bottom of your emails, because then you're totally, totally fine. Great question. Um, so there was another question that came in to just quickly demonstrate where the custom announcement form is. Um, by screen sharing, which is a functionality that we have, so we should probably use it. <laughs> Hang on one second, and I'll just show everyone where that is. Um, Tara, I'm going to bump you for a minute. That's fine. Done. All right, so everyone can see this. This is the organizer's corner. Um, so you can see in this account that I'm in, I don't have any activities upcoming. Um, if I want to post the custom activity, I just click right here, takes one second to load, and then I have my full, sorry, my internet has been a little bit slow here, a little overwhelmed with the Zoom. We had another question about how to set a default setting to just look at my area or state without having to reset filters each time. That is a great function uh, request. We will add that to the functionality queue. So right now, you it resets for every user. Um, but basically what you're asking for is like, I'm a member and I know I only care about this state, so why don't I just default the calendar when I'm logged in to showing the state? Great, great idea. So we will add that to the development queue. I think that's really good. Okay. All right. So I think that adds pretty much all of them. Um, if you have questions after this, where I guess we're at eight o'clock, so we're almost timing out. If questions after this, you've got the, I will share the screen so everybody has it. 
you've got, I believe you can see the PowerPoint. You've got that URL, hopefully. Uh, so give us a shout out at Strider Pro. You can also contact me and Natasha um, personally. We'll send out our emails in the follow-up resource guide. I didn't want to put it here because I didn't want them on the internet um, for spam blocking. Uh, but definitely shoot us a question. Uh, welcome any ideas you all have or any sort of functionality request. The reason we got the e-signature capability built in was because some of the organizers said, what can you do um, to get this uploaded quickly after COVID? So let us know what else you need and we're happy to help you figure it out. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks so much for attending. We appreciate it. Take care.